Hello again everyone and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, what we're going to do is check out Semaphore. Semaphore is really cool. It allows you to set up basically a GUI for your Ansible playbooks. Not all that unlike Ansible Tower, but it's really easy to use. It's really cool. I had a chance to check it out recently, so I figured I would create this video to show it to you guys. So in this video, what I'm going to do is guide you through the setup process for Semaphore every step of the way. And by the end of the video, you'll have your very own Semaphore server set up and ready to go. Now, before we get into today's video, though, I need to thank the sponsor for today's video. Actually, there is no sponsor for today's video. Why? Well, because I wanted to get this video out to you guys as quickly as possible. But not only that, so many of you guys visited the official Learn Linux TV shop that this video is covered. So if you want to see additional videos without sponsorship, then why don't you just visit the Learn Linux TV shop, buy yourself something nice, and support Linux learning at the same time. It's a win-win. Inside the shop, you'll find distro-themed shirts, bags, drinkware, and more. And there's some other surprises there as well. For example, I've just introduced a mouse pad that doubles as a Tmux cheat sheet. How cool is that? You could get an awesome distro hopper shirt or an apt install coffee shirt. There's all kinds of cool stuff in the official shop. So support the channel and check it out, and I would really appreciate it. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, it's time to get started. So without any further hesitation, let's do exactly that and check out Semaphore. What I have right here is a virtual machine, a cloud server actually, that I created on Akamai. So if you want to follow along with me, I recommend that you install a Linux distribution and follow along. I'm going to be using Debian on my end so if you want to follow along, that's what I recommend. That's what I tested all of these steps against. If you use a different distribution, these steps might not work. But if you need some help, you can sign up at the forums and maybe someone there can help you if you run into a problem. But I'm ready to get started, so let's do it. Now, as a quick aside, I am currently running Debian 12. So at this point, what I recommend is that you make sure that your server is fully up to date. I have a video on my channel already that goes over everything that you should do when it comes to setting up a Linux server for the very first time. So if you haven't already checked out that video, then I recommend you do check that out, complete all of the steps in that video, and once you're done, come back over here and we'll continue. The main reason why I'm having you do that is to make sure that you have all available updates installed and that you properly secure SSH. But I've covered all of that in other videos, so let's get started with this one. Now the first thing that I want to do is create a user for Semaphore to run under. So what we want to do is create a user for Semaphore itself. So let's take care of that right now. So what I'll do is run sudo and then add user. And then we want to create a system user. And I have a video already that covers user management on my channel if you want to learn more about that. But again, I'm creating a system user here. I would also like a group created along with the user. In addition to that, I'd like a home directory. And I'll just use slash home slash semaphore. And the reason why I'm calling all of this out is because I'm creating a system user. So this user might not have had a home directory normally if it's a system user. But in this case, I'm being explicit. I am telling the system that no matter what type of user I'm creating, I want to ensure that this user has a home directory. So I added dash dash home. And then I gave it slash home slash semaphore as the home directory that I want to use for this user. And finally, what username do I want to create? I have all of these options here, but I haven't even told the system yet what user I want to create. So what I'll do is call this particular user semaphore, just like that. So I'll press enter, and it looks like the user was created. If I tail Etsy password, we can see the semaphore user there at the end. The UID and group ID is 103 and 110 respectively. Notice how the UID and GID are both three digits. My username, one line above that, has a UID that's four digits long, so anything under 1000 is a system user when it comes to the UID. Anyway, the next thing we want to do is create a database for this particular application. Semaphore needs a database server. There's multiple database engines that you can use here, but what I'm going to do is run sudo apt update. I want to make sure that my package repository index is completely up to date which you probably don't even have to do if you just updated your system anyway, like I just did this morning. But the next thing we want to do is install MariaDB. 
It's a drop-in replacement for MySQL. Pretty much the same thing, but what I'll do is run sudo apt install, and then MariaDB hyphen server, just like that. And I will have all of these commands in the official blog post for this video, which will be linked down in the description below. So if you want to copy and paste the commands that I'm using, you can go ahead and go to that article, grab the commands, and do exactly that. But anyway, I'll press enter here. I do want to install that package. There's going to be some dependencies that'll come along for the ride, and that's totally fine. So I'll press enter. And I'll let these download, and I'll be right back. So MariaDB is now installed, but just to make sure, let's run systemctl and then status. Notice that the name of the service is MariaDB, but we installed MariaDB hyphen server, but this command is correct, as you can see. That's how we check the status. Sometimes the names do vary when it comes to things like this, but we can see that it's active and running. It's enabled. Enabled means that MariaDB, in this case, will start when the server starts. Active means it's running right now. So we should be able to access it. And let's see if we can. And a fast way to do that is run sudo and then MariaDB, just like that. I'll press enter. And notice that our prompt has changed. We are now inside the MariaDB shell. I'm going to exit for now. We just want to make sure that's all working. Before we start using MariaDB, we should secure it a bit. So let's work on that now. So to do that, run sudo and then MySQL underscore secure underscore installation. And even though we installed MariaDB, I'm using MySQL in the syntax here. That's intended, that's totally fine because MariaDB is a drop-in replacement for MySQL. Sometimes some things are still called MySQL, but for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. I'll press enter. And now we're going to be asked a series of questions here for how we want to better secure our database server. Now these questions will not result in a secure server despite the name of the command here. The server will be more secure, yes, but not secure. What this will do for us is give us a basic level of security, a minimum layer of security, basically. So we definitely wanna make sure that we do at least this. Now, if you just set up the server as I just did, you probably don't have a password for the root user for MySQL or MariaDB. So in this case, it's not talking about the root Linux user, it's talking about the root MySQL or MariaDB user. And right now I don't have a password on that user because I literally just installed MariaDB. So I'll press enter since there is not a password here currently. Now when it comes to switching to Unix socket authentication, it's beyond the scope of this video, I'm just going to say no here and I'll press enter. Now it's asking me if I would like to change the root password. If you don't have a root password, then I recommend that you do this. I could press enter because Y is capital, which means it's the default. And now it's asking me to create a password for the root MariaDB or the root MySQL user. I recommend that you create a randomly generated password, but since this is just a demo and I'm going to nuke the server as soon as I'm done recording, then what I'll do is just make a simple password just to make the recording process easier on myself here. So I've typed it in. Remove anonymous users. I'll press enter for the default of yes. And do we want to disallow root login remotely? Yes, we do. I'll press enter for the default of yes on this as well. Remove the test database and remove access to it. Well, yeah, I'm not going to use it. So I'll press enter for the default of yes yet again. Reload the privilege tables, enter for yes. And that's it. We have given our server a basic layer of security or a default level of security for MariaDB. Again, it's just minimum practice here, but we wanted to do at least that. So now that we've run the MySQL secure installation command, let's run sudo MariaDB again. We ran this earlier just to see if it's working. And the first thing I'll do is create the database that we'll be using for Semaphore. So I'll type create database in all caps and then the name of the database. And I'll call mine semaphore DB, and I'll end the statement with a semicolon, as we're always supposed to be doing, and I constantly keep forgetting. Anyway, I'll press enter. If I type show databases, we can see the database semaphore DB is right there on the list. The other databases there just came along with MariaDB, their default databases. We're not gonna do too much with those. Anyway, Clear the screen, it was control L if you were curious, and we'll run the next command. Now the next thing we're going to do is create a user for the Semaphore database. This will be a user that's dedicated to accessing the database. We don't wanna use root for anything, especially not the database. 
So what we'll do is create a database user right now. And what I'll also do is give that user permission to the database. And I'm going to do it all in one command. And I'm going to give you that command right now. So we're going to type grant, then all privileges, and then on. Then we'll type the name of the database. This has to match. I called it semaphore underscore DB, and then dot star. So basically, you want to grant all privileges on semaphore DB and everything underneath it, which is what the asterisk is, essentially. But who do we want to grant those privileges to? Well, what I'm going to do is create a user named semaphore underscore user. Then I'll type an at symbol, localhost. I don't want anyone to be logging into the database from anywhere else. Since Semaphore will be running on the same server, it's going to access the database locally. There's no need for it to go out to the internet or the network for anything. We definitely don't want our database server exposed to the internet anyway. But what I'll do here is give access to a user named Semaphore underscore user. I'll give that access to the Semaphore database. But we're not done yet. Identified by. And then in single quotes, what we'll do is type the password that we want this user to have. Again, create a randomly generated password. I'll use something easy in my case, just for the demo. And then what we'll do is end the statement with a semicolon. So far, so good. And the final command that we'll run here in the MySQL or MariaDB shell is flush and then privileges. We just wanna make sure that everything takes effect. So we'll run that command right there. It says that it's okay. And now what we'll do is exit. Good job so far. We have a database server. I walked you through the process of setting up MariaDB and also creating the database. Now that we have the database, let's see what the process looks like to install Semaphore. What we'll do is we'll go to GitHub. And so we'll hyphen Semaphore slash Semaphore slash releases slash latest. I'll press enter. And this URL will be down in the description below, but what we're going to do is download the latest version. So we'll scroll down a bit. And what we want to do is find the dev file. In our case, since we're using Debian, and here it is. We're not going to download it though. What we'll do instead is right click on it and copy the link address. I have a connection to my Semaphore server open right here. So what I'll do is just type wget. And then I'll paste in the URL that we copied from the releases page right after that. And I'm having you do it this way because, well, that's going to change from time to time. As they release new versions, the URL will change. But if you go to that URL manually, the one that I gave you, and then grab the full URL to the dev file, you should be fine. So let's grab that file. Looks like it was done. And sure enough, there it is. So what we'll do now is install it. So we'll run sudo apt and then install dot forward slash. We can start typing the name of the dev file that we've downloaded. Press tab and it should auto complete. I'm going to use the apt package manager to install the semaphore package. Even though I've downloaded it locally, I want apt to resolve any conflicts or maybe there's going to be dependencies or something. I want apt to handle it. So that's what I'll do. I'll press enter. And check this out. It's letting me know that some additional packages will be required. That's a good reason to use apt install. Again, even though apt install is primarily used for pulling things from the internet, I downloaded a file, I saved it locally, and I'm pointing apt directly at the locally downloaded file, which if you didn't know you could do that, now you do. Anyway, I'll press enter for the default of yes. Let's get this installed. Since we have Semaphore installed now, you can run semaphore and then set up to create the config file. And what this is going to do is ask us a series of questions so that way we can configure how we want semaphore to work. In our case, we installed MariaDB. It's a drop-in replacement for MySQL, so I'll choose MySQL. Number one for that, I'll press enter. The database host name, unless you have a remote database server, most of you probably won't, you'll leave this as its default. If yours is different, you could type that in here. For the user, we created that as semaphore underscore user. For the database password, I'll type that in right now. And then I'll press enter. 
When it comes to the name of the database, we call that semaphore underscore DB. So that's what I'll add here. Everything has to match. Playbook path, I'll leave that as its default option. I'll press enter. Republic URL, what I'll do is leave this blank. I don't have a domain or anything. If you do, feel free to add some information here, but we'll probably be better off just by pressing enter. We can always edit the config file if we need to. Enable email alerts, I'll say no, but if that's something that you want to do, you can. If you say yes here, it's going to ask you for the information for your mail server, so you would need to be prepared to answer that. But since this is just a demo, and I don't even run my own mail server anyway, I'll just say no, which is the default, so I'll press enter. Enable telegram alerts, don't want to use that, but if you have use for that, you can do that. Enable Slack alerts, again, if you have use for that, you can do that. Rocket Chat, no. I'm just pressing enter, which is the default on most of these. Team, no. LDAP, no. And the output directory, that's just going to be where the config file is going to be stored. I'm only temporarily storing it in my home directory, so for right now, that's fine. I'll press enter. Now that's done, so we need to type a username. This is the username that we will use to log in to Semaphore with. So I'll type in J for mine. My email. This is just a demo. Password, I'll type in something super simple, literally. And I highly don't recommend you use that password. If you're curious, this particular instance is firewalled, so it's not accessible from the outside. So I can use a password like that because it's a demo, but anyway, what we're gonna do is check out what we've done so far. And as you can see, we have config.json right there. And if we open that up, we can see that this file basically includes all of the answers to the things that we answered during the questionnaire as part of the installer. So it just has the answers to those questions. If you want to go in here and change something, you can absolutely do that. But I'm going to exit out here and we're going to move on to the next step. Now, again, we have the config.json file there. We also have our semaphore download. I don't really need that anymore, so I'll get rid of it. And now I'm down to just that file. Now, in order for that file to be of use to us, what we're going to need to do is put that in a location where semaphore can find it. I used semaphore just now to create the file, but semaphore is not running. So what we'll do is first change ownership. So I'll run sudo chown. We want that file to be owned by the semaphore user that we created earlier, colon, and also the semaphore group. And I want that applied against the file config.json, which is there now that we've added that. So I'll run sudo make directory for mkdir. We're going to create etsy semaphore. That's where we're going to be putting that file. And I could have done this all in one step, but you know what? This works as well. But we want to make sure that the semaphore user can open that directory, so we'll make sure that we set the ownership there as well. Finally, we'll want to move config.json into slash etsy slash semaphore. I'll press enter. And now, as you can see, our config file is in the Etsy semaphore directory, which is exactly where it's supposed to be. Another thing that we're going to need in order for semaphore to work is to have Ansible itself installed. In order to do that, we'll run sudo apt install, and then Ansible, just like that. So I'll press enter, and then enter again. This shouldn't take too long. It's a pretty small download. And there we go. Now the next thing we're going to do is test Semaphore and see if it's working. We're not quite done yet. There's some additional configuration that we'll need to add, but we want to make sure everything's working so far before we go any further. So that way we don't have too much to check if we run into a problem. So what I'll do is run Semaphore, and then server, dash dash config, slash Etsy, slash Semaphore, slash config.json. We're telling it where to find the config file. We'll make all of this permanent later. This is just a test, but anyway, what I'll do is press enter. 
and it tells me that the server is running. Is it? I don't know. Let's see. So to access Semaphore, what we're going to do is type localhost port 3000. Now, most of you will probably need to change localhost to something else, probably the IP address of the server that you are installing this onto. But what I'll do is just paste in the IP address to my cloud instance here. So if you are running Semaphore on your local machine, use localhost, meaning if you're running it from your workstation, your laptop or your desktop, but if you're running it from a server, you could type in the IP address or the domain name. So for most of you, again, type in the IP address right here and colon port 3000, that should get you in. And check it out, we have Ansible Semaphore. We should also test the login as well. If you remember, part of the process had us create a user and password, so I'll type in that right now. I typed in mine, I'll press enter, and check it out, we're in. We have successfully ran Ansible Semaphore. But we're not done yet. We know it works, so that's good, but we wanna make this more permanent. We want this to be more self-sufficient. So let's see what we could do to make this even better. The next thing that we're going to do is create a systemd service. This will help us automatically start Semaphore every time we start the server. To do that, I'll run sudo and then nano and slash etsy slash systemd slash system, call it semaphore.service. And what I'll do here is paste in the information for the systemd service. I'm not going to go over every line in detail because I have entire videos that cover systemd in general. But what I'll do is paste in everything right here. And if you wanna do the same, then what I recommend you do is go to the description down below. You can visit the official blog post for this video and everything will be right there if you want to copy and paste everything into this window, just like I'm about to do. Basically what we're doing is we're creating a systemd service file and this service file contains instructions for running Semaphore every time the server starts up. It's going to set a description, just like you see here. It's going to use exec start to tell systemd what command to run when Semaphore starts, and so on. I'll leave a card for a systemd video right about here if you want to learn more about this. But what I'm going to do is save the file, and we should be done for that step. The next thing we'll do is reload systemd. And to do that, we'll run sudo and then systemctl daemon hyphen reload just like that. And what this will do for us is just refresh systemd to let it know that we created a file, a new service file. It's possible that it might already work, but we just wanna make sure that systemd, you know, reloads itself, refreshes itself, or however you wanna put it. So that's what this command here does for us. And now that's done. Now what we're gonna do is type systemctl status, and then semaphore.service. And this will help us understand if systemd recognizes the service file here. So I'll press enter, and it looks like it did. There's not a lot of information here, and that's okay. Right now, it's telling me that Semaphore is disabled, and it's also inactive, which means it's not running. Next, let's enable Semaphore, and to do that, I'll run sudo systemctl, and then enable, and then the unit or service file that I want to enable, is the one that we just created, semaphore.service. And if I check the status again, we can see that it's enabled. It's still not running, but it's enabled. If I want to get this running, what I could do is run sudo systemctl and then start semaphore.service. And if we check the status, we can see that it's running. It's enabled, so the next time I start this server right here, it's going to automatically start Semaphore for me, which is pretty cool. We also see that it's working. So let's see if it's actually working. And it is. The page automatically refreshed itself in the background while I was recording, but I stopped this particular server before, and we just created a systemd service file. We started Semaphore through that service file, so you know what? Looks like we're doing pretty good. But it wants us to create a project. What's up with that? What do we do here? Well, let's just go through the process. I'll just create a test project. 
and then I'll click Create. We want to create our first project within Semaphore. And now we've done that. So your project is where you're going to keep everything that's related to, well, the project. Your SSH keys, your repository, inventory files, things like that are all going to go underneath the project. Now we'll come back to this, but what we want to do right now is go to github.com. We're going to need a GitHub account for this. So what I'll do is log in. I will be right back. So here we have the official Learn Linux TV GitHub account. And what I'm going to do is create a repository. And what this is going to do for us is give us a place to store a playbook. I'm going to create an Ansible playbook. And then I'm going to have the Ansible Semaphore server run that playbook for us. So what we'll do first is create a repository. So I'll click right here. I'll create a new repository. For the repository name, let's give it a name. And I'll call mine semaphore-video. And this repository will be live when you watch this video. So if you want to grab the code for the playbook from the repository, you can actually do that. I'll scroll down and I'll create the repository. Next, what I'll do is make sure I'm on HTTPS mode and I will copy the repository. Now that we've done that, let's go back to Semaphore and we'll click on repositories. Let's add one. And then for the URL, I'll paste in the GitHub repository URL right here. For branch, we'll just use the main branch. That should be fine. And then for access key, I'll choose none because there isn't one. If you have a private repository, you will need this. But since mine isn't private, this should be fine when it comes to selecting none for this. So let's create it. Now we have the repository. Sorry to interrupt myself, but I just wanted to let you know that I really enjoy making this content for you guys. I have a ton of fun. If you enjoy the content that I produce, then please consider supporting Learn Linux TV. The thing is, producing content like this isn't cheap. So by giving back to the channel, you can help me make even more content for you guys. And to find out more about how you can support Learn Linux TV, what you could do is go to support.learnlinux.tv and there you'll find some of the ways that you can help support the channel. Anyway, let's get back to the video. Next, I'll click on environment. We're just creating all of the things that Semaphore is going to need when we want to test it out, which we'll be doing shortly. So I'll click new environment. So for the name of the environment, what I'll do is call it production. I want to create a production environment. And then what I'll do is create an extra variable here. We have to put something in here. We could have just left the empty braces if we didn't want to put anything at all. I think we may as well put something here. Why not? So I'll put var underscore environment. And I just had two spaces in front, if you were curious. Another have a double quote here, colon, space, double quotes again. I'm going to set this to production. Let's go ahead and save it. Now we have a production environment to use. And moving on from there, we'll need an SSH key. So what we'll do is click on key store right here to create that. Let's click new key. It'll be my own key. I'll just go ahead and use that name there. Then what I'll do is click SSH key. For the username, I'll use mine. You want to make sure that you use the username for your user for your server. If you want to add an SSH key that has a passphrase, you can add that right here if you'd like. But what we're going to do is create a key locally on our local computer, and then we're going to paste that information right here. So we'll leave this window open, and then we'll open up a terminal. And what we'll do is generate a key. If you have a Mac, for example, then you could use the built-in terminal to do this. If you are using Windows, you could use Windows Terminal. Or if you want to just keep it simple for this demo, you could have used the password option earlier. But I think the SSH key is always the best way to go. So what I'll do is generate a key right now. So I'll type SSH key gen. Enter the path. You can leave this on as default if you'd like. 
Now, if you already have a key here, though, it is going to overwrite that. So you do want to make sure that you're aware whether or not you have a key at that location before you press enter. I know that I don't, so I'll press enter. For the passphrase, I recommend that you create one, but I'll just keep it simple for this demo. I'll just press enter, enter again, and that's it. Now what I'll do is cat the contents of that file. And this will show the contents of the private key. Now I'm going to warn you, you don't want anyone to see this. If anyone sees the contents of your private key, you can no longer trust that key. The only reason why I'm getting away with it right now and not blurring this out is simply because, well, I'll be deleting this server by the time you're seeing this video anyway, so even if you did copy down this key, it would do you no good at all. But on your end, definitely make sure that you keep something like this hidden. But what we're going to do is copy all of this text right here, go back to our browser, and we're going to paste it right here in the private key box, which I've done. So I'll click Create, and now we have that credential stored right here. Next up, we'll go to Inventory and we will create a new inventory file. And here we have all the information that we're going to add into this box. Now, what I recommend you do is try to get another server, another Linux VM, if you'd like. It should be pretty easy to do. Again, everything you need is in the description down below. So what we'll do is save the file. And now we have an inventory file, but there's one important piece we don't have, and it's one of the more important pieces. We don't really have anything for Ansible Semaphore to do, do we? Nothing at all. If we go to Task Templates, we could create a template, and this will be our job template. So I'll just fill this out right here. And I'll just call it Test Job, I guess. The playbook file name, we'll just use site.yml. The inventory will be the one that we just created. Repository is the one that we just added. Environment is production, we added that too. We don't have a vault password. Should be good enough. We'll click Create, and we're going to move on to the next step. So I'm here with my Semaphore target. That's what I named the server. Also, notice that I'm logged in as my user right here. That's really important. We want to make sure that we don't use root unless we absolutely have to. But we're going to use root one more time, actually. So what I'll do is run sudo su. What we want to do is configure sudoers so that someone that is a sudoer won't have to use a password. Normally, you would have a semaphore user on the target, but I'm going to keep it simple and just use my user. Again, normally you wouldn't do that. You'd have a configuration user on the other server that would take care of all of that. Anyway, what we'll do is change directory into slash etsy slash sudoers.d. We'll list the storage and we don't really have anything there right now. But what I'll do is create a new file here. We need to name it the same as the user that Semaphore will use on the target. I only have my user right now, again, so I'll just create a file named j, just like my local user account is named j. And what do I put inside that file? Well, what I'll do is type J, or semaphore if you created a semaphore user, for example. All in all caps equals, and then in parentheses, all in uppercase again, no past WD, colon, then all in all caps. Make sure that you have everything here exactly as I typed it. The only thing that should be different is the username, the very first thing on this line. That should match your username or the name of the user that you plan on using with Semaphore when it comes to making the connection. So this is what I'll be using right here. I'll save the file, I'll close out, and then we'll need to change the permission of that file. Right now it's readable by everybody. We don't want that, so let's fix it. We'll use 440 for the permissions. I have an entire video that covers that if you want to learn more about permissions. But we're going to change the permission on that file, the one that we just created. So now it should look like this. 
We have read for the owner, read for group, and nothing for anything else. So if yours looks like mine, other than the name, then you should be good to continue. So now, on the semaphore server, what we want to do is try to SSH into the target, the semaphore target, basically, again, the machine that semaphore is going to be configuring. We just want to make sure that this works. So what we'll do is type SSH along with the username for the user on the other end. And there it is. We'll type yes here. We'll type in our password for the other server. And notice that the bash prompt here changed to semaphore target. I'm logged into the target server. Now that I know that I can do that, and also gave me a chance to answer that prompt anyway, what I'm going to do is copy the SSH key that we've just created over to that server. To do that, we'll run ssh-copy-id-i, then tilde slash dot ssh, id rsa dot pub, just like that. And we're going to run that against the server that we are going to be using as the target. So we're copying the SSH key to the target server. We'll type in our password. And it looks like it worked. In order to confirm that, if we recall the SSH command, where I logged into that server initially, if it's working, I should be able to log into that server without a password prompt. And it worked. So now we should have everything we need here, but what I'm going to do is log out of the target and we're gonna work on one last thing before we see this in action. The last piece of the puzzle just so happens to be the YAML file that we referred to earlier. It's in our job template, but we have yet to create it. So let's just go ahead and do that right now. And to do that, a simple way is to create a new file and I've pasted in the code right here. Again, just grab this code right from the blog post, and that should be all you should need to do for that. But next what we'll do is just give it a name. We don't wanna call it site.yml. We'll click the Create button. And I'm just leaving all of this at its defaults, simple right here. We have the site.yml file. And we should have everything that we need to give this a test run. So let's do it. So to set this up, here's what we'll do. What I'll do is go back to my inventory here. I'm just going to grab the IP address of the target server. And we're going to confirm that nothing happens when I paste the IP address into my browser here. And nothing is happening. This is intentional, nothing should happen. So when you type in the IP address of your target server here, you should get nothing. Let's see if we can fix that. We'll go back to semaphore, and then we'll go back to task templates. And what we're going to do is run this job, the job that we created earlier. Let's see what happens. I'll click run, and then run again, and let's see if it works. And it looks like it was successful. It says that it changed something here. So let's refresh the page and see if Apache is installed. And sure enough, it is. Now the next thing that we could set up is an Nginx proxy. This is completely optional, but I do recommend it because it does make the process of accessing Semaphore a bit easier. Right now, as you can see, we are accessing Semaphore via port 3000. If we had this set up via port 80, we wouldn't even have to designate the port at all. So what we're going to do is set that up right now. We'll set up an Nginx proxy, and then after that, what we'll also do is see the process of attaching a domain and a certificate to Semaphore as well. But it all starts with Nginx, so let's get that set up right now. So to get started, here's what we'll do. We will run sudo apt install, and then the package we want to install is Nginx, just like that. So I'll press enter. Enter again. And Nginx is installed. 
Now, this doesn't really help us out all that much as of yet, because if we go back to our browser, and I refresh my session here, nothing's different. We're still on port 3000, so nothing's changed. Now, if we were to access this same server, so just copy the same IP address, but without the port of 3000, what do you think is going to happen? Well, what happens is we will see the Nginx start page. So what we have here is a web server on port 80, and then we also have Semaphore presenting a web server on port 3000. So what we're going to do is delete this start page here and replace it with a configuration file that's going to set up Nginx as a proxy instead of a web server. And what it's going to do is redirect everyone that goes to this IP address to port 3000. So that way, no one has to do that manually. So let's see what that process looks like. As you can see, Nginx is currently running. We already knew that anyway because we were able to see the start page. But what I want to do is stop the service since we really don't want something running that has yet to be configured. So I'll stop the service. And as you can see, it's not running. The next thing we're going to do is navigate to slash Etsy slash Nginx. And once there, what you'll see is that we have a number of config files here. What we'll want to do is go to sites available. And inside this directory, we have default. Everything in this file is commented out, which means that this is representing a default Nginx config file with really nothing going on at all. So what we want to do is add our own config file. So what we'll do is just get rid of the one that's here. You could choose to create a backup copy of this file here or delete it. It's up to you. We'll make a backup copy of it. Again, there's our file. So I'll run sudo mv. And I'll move it to default.bak. And now, as you can see, we have only the backup file currently on the system. Now inside this folder, we have a default file named similarly to the original. At this point, default is pointing to slash Etsy slash Nginx slash sites available slash default, the very file that we just deleted, which is the reason why it's colored red right now. But what we'll do is just go ahead and remove this file. It's just a pointer anyway, and we will be recreating this. So I'll just remove it for now. And now Nginx has no config at all whatsoever. But that shouldn't matter. What we'll do is go back one directory and we will navigate to sites available. That's where we had our default file originally. But what we'll do right now is create a config file for Semaphore. So I'll run sudo and then nano and then semaphore.conf just like that. I'll press enter. And we have an empty file. And as usual, what I'll do is paste in the code that we'll need for this config file right here, right now. And here it is. As always, you'll find all the commands and the code that I'm using in this video in the official blog post for this video, link down below. But right here, we have the Semaphore config file. It's beyond the scope of this video to give you a tutorial on Nginx. So what we'll do right now is just leave this file as is. But the only thing that I would recommend that you change is the server name. It's the fourth line down, and in my case, it's semaphore.learnlinux.tv. And that's the one that I will be using for the purposes of the Nginx proxy. But don't worry if you don't have a domain. If you don't, then check out the blog post for this video because inside that blog post, what I'll do is have an alternative version of this config file. And the purpose of that config file is to omit the domain itself. So that way you won't have to worry about it. You will still benefit though, because that config file will forward port 80 to port 3000. So there's still a benefit, even if you don't have a domain, but it is highly recommended. Anyway, what I'll do is save the file and I'll close out. What I'll do now is restart Nginx. And we'll see if it works. Well, it certainly didn't give me any errors, did it? Let's check the status. 
and check that out. It's active and running. Next, what we'll do is set up a TLS certificate for our server. We'll do that through CertBot, and to set up CertBot, we will need SnapD per the instructions on the CertBot website. So what we'll do is run sudo apt install, and then SnapD, just like that. We'll press enter. And now that's done. And then next we'll run sudo and then snap install, dash dash classic. And then the name of the package is going to be certbot, just like that. So I'll press enter, let's get that going. And there it is, certbot is now installed on the server. So far so good. And just like we created a symbolic link earlier, we need to create another one right now for certbot this time. And for that, we'll run sudo and then ln-s slash snap slash bin slash certbot. And we will link that to slash user slash bin slash certbot. And there we go. Next, we'll attempt to set up a certificate for our semaphore server. So for that, we'll run sudo and then certbot dash dash nginx. Press enter. Enter the email address. I'll type in mine right here. I'll agree to the terms. I'll decline this for now. I'll choose option one. That's the correct domain in my case. And there we go. It looks like we have a certificate on our Semaphore server. And let's test it out. I'm still logged in here, but what I want to do is remove everything here. I'll type in my domain, just like that, and let's see what happens. And take a look at that. Not only did I set up a Semaphore server, I set it up securely. And with that out of the way, I think that's pretty much everything you need for Semaphore. Congratulations, you now have yourself your very own Semaphore server. How cool is that? I hope you had a ton of fun watching this video like I did making this video. And if you did, well, why don't you click that like button to let YouTube know how you feel. That might result in more Linux content here on YouTube. I would really appreciate that. In the meantime though, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it and I'll see you in the next one.